after the big hit with Disney Sember, everyone's been asking me the same thing. Do the DreamWorks movies, do the DreamWorks movies. And yeah, actually I guess that does sort of figure now, doesn't it? In the old days, the big competition used to be Disney and Warner Brothers, and in some ways they still are competitors, but when it comes to film, hands down, Disney won the battle. But now a new contender seems to have come out of nowhere known as DreamWorks. DreamWorks, in many ways, is to Disney what Warner Brothers cartoons are to Disney cartoons. Disney was always described as the classical music of cartoons, where Warner Brothers were described as jazz. Disney and DreamWorks seem to work the same way. Both are alike in many ways, but DreamWorks seems to take a few more chances, for the most part. They too try to succumb to what the general audience will enjoy, but they throw in a few more twists and turns. Stories and characters that are a little bit more off-color. That is, at least compared to the Disney formula. And it turned out to be a success, with many of their movies being big hits, and some of them not being. But financial stability doesn't always mean artistic success, so let's take the month of February to look through all of DreamWorks' animated features. This is the month I like to call... dreamworks you wary Yeah, that's what I'm going with. I, I know that. SHUT UP! Let's start with DreamWorks' very first anime feature, Ants. The controversial predecessor to A Bug's Life. Did Disney think of the idea first? Did Katzenberg? Blah, 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 who cares? Let's just look at the movie as a whole. The film stars an ant named Z, played by Woody Allen. He's, big surprise, a neurotic, living in a colony of ants where it's very easy to lose your identity. He has friends here and there, but for the most part, he finds it hard to fit in. That is, until he accidentally comes across the Queen's daughter, played by Sharon Stone. Which is weird, because yeah, they're all technically her children, but I guess somehow they single her out as princess because she's being trained to carry the children neck. Don't know how it works, but they have a romance and seem to hit it off. But while uncovering an evil plan from a general land, played by Gene Hackman, Z and the princess get whisked away outside of the colony. And thus, the two are on a hair-raising adventure against humans, other insects, and even their own kind to find what they call paradise, known as Insectopia, which is really nothing more than a garbage can. As a first film, this is pretty damn good from an animation company. The CG now is a touch dated, but when it came out, it was pretty impressive. I find it interesting that I actually don't have a hard time telling the ants apart. They're not drawn like typical cartoon characters with big eyes or big expressions, but somehow I actually do know which ones are which. Part of that comes from the incredibly distinct voices that they have. Yeah, this movie really crams the celebrities in there. I mean, there's a ton. But to its credit, they all sort of fit. Woody Allen as the neurotic, that's a no-brainer. Gene Hackman as the bad guy, that works, obviously. Stallone as a soldier, obviously, fits well. Jennifer Lopez as one of the tough miners, that works, too. Danny Glover as a supportive comrade. Dan Aykroyd as a snobby sophisticate. These actually really do fall together. That is all except for one. What the hell is Christopher Walken doing in this movie? And I'm not at all about the Christopher Walken hate. Anything he's in, I'll take it. But I... J why? He has, like, no role. He's the assistant to the general, and that's it. There's no other character to him. He's not weird, he's not strange, and his voice sticks out like a sore thumb. Imagine it. A strong colony, sir. A colony we can be proud of. I just remember snickering the whole time, because every time he opened his mouth, I'd be like, oh, that's Christopher Walken, and he sounds funny. I wish he was given funny stuff to do. But while we're on the subject, the film is pretty funny. I mean, okay, not knee-slapping funny, but it certainly does great in creating these grand environments, made out of everyday small things. Their view of the world and the way they actually act as a colony is pretty entertaining. Literally, at birth, they decide whether or not they're gonna be a worker or a soldier. And of course, there's a lot of obvious commentary in either following the pack or being an individual, and where you draw the line. Which is why I think the film really does work better for maybe a younger audience. I remember when I saw this, I was a junior in high school. I was going through my rebellious artist phase, and this is just the movie I wanted to see. Not realizing that a bajillion movies more that year and the following years were going to come with a very similar message. That's not a bad message, it's just kind of been hammered to death in other films, and yeah, this one kind of hammers it to death too. But what makes it stand out is the characters, the environments they create, and the fact that while it's animated, it doesn't go totally kid-friendly. I mean, yeah, kids can watch it, and like I said, I enjoyed it in high school. But the designs aren't as colorful or baby-friendly as something like Pixar can be. 
neither is the story of the content for that matter, and I think that gives it a little bit more of an edge. Even the bad guy's diabolical plan at first I thought was kind of cliched. What, he just wants to wipe out the weak, start all over, and have a survival of the fittest type thing? But when you really look at the way they set up this colony and the way things work, yeah, actually you can see how a character like that would be formed. I even give credit to the fact that the bugs are not all the same size, like in a bug's life. Everything is actually to scale. The termites are much bigger, mantises are much bigger, bees are much bigger. It's like, yeah, bugs aren't all the same size, and that makes for a much more entertaining and threatening world to go through. So I really like the film. Does it have flaws? Sure, is the message a little passe? A touch. But I think it still stands out as being a very unique tongue-in-cheek adventure. And audiences at the time seem to like it too. But this would turn out to be only the first big hit in DreamWorks' lineup. I've talked a lot about Prince of Egypt before on Nostalgia Critic, both on the top 11 underrated nostalgia classics and the old versus new of Prince of Egypt versus Ten Commandments. So I'll try to keep this relatively short and try to say stuff I haven't said before. The story, I think, is a safe bet you probably know. The Pharaoh has decided that the slaves have grown too large in size, so he sends his soldiers to perform mass genocide. But one family wants their baby to live, puts him in a basket, and sends him floating down the river, where, oddly enough, the basket comes across the queen and decides to adopt the baby and call him Moses. Years later, Moses grows up and realizes his true heritage. Disgraced by who he is, he leaves his brother and family behind and finds a life of peace far away. But that doesn't last for long as God himself comes down and tells Moses that he is to be the deliverer of the Jews. Moses returns, finding his brother is now Pharaoh, and the epic battle begins between Pharaoh and Moses over what will happen to the Jewish people. The film is gorgeous. This is one of the best looking animated films I've ever seen. I'm not even really a big fan of Egypt or the desert, but by god the shots and the angles they get in it, it's just unbelievable. So much attention is being drawn to how to tell this story faithfully, but not exactly the same as the Ten Commandments. And it does exactly that. It has its own unique style and its own unique look. Even the characters are different. The relationship between the brothers seems genuine. They both now have grown up and they both now have new responsibilities that they wish to honor and do not want to break. But at the same time, they're still family. And this is what makes great drama. There's Val Kilmer as Moses and Ray Fiennes as Ramesses, and both of them are fantastic. Even the other celebrity voices, though distracting at times, like Jeff Goldblum or Patrick Stewart, still match well to the character and tone that the movie's trying to get across. It's just distracting in that you can tell it's their voices, but you warm up to them pretty quick. Something else I've never talked about is the music. The music is also wonderful. I think the theme they have for the burning bush is one of the most comforting, nicest themes I've ever heard. It's just a great sound and creates this wonderful mood. Now some people can and have been turned off by this movie because, well, while Ten Commandments was just intended for adults, this is more older children and adults. That is to say, there are songs, there is some comedy relief, and there are some weirdly drawn characters. And yes, that can be distracting at times, like half the time there's no segue into the song, Steve Martin and Martin Short as the High Priest are a little odd and out of place at times. And horrible to say, but because it is sort of a Disney style, maybe it could have benefited more from a little bit more of the Disney design. I mean, some of them look good, but others do look kind of odd. But with that said, the distracting moments are never too distracting. And you know what? I like the songs. I think they help move along the story and they do it in a very visually and musically interesting way. So I don't mind them, I think they really work. But many would argue if you're really gonna tell the story of Moses and you want to step up your animation company and make it more adult, you should probably leave some of the stuff behind. I'd be lying if I said I didn't feel that was totally true, especially with something as heavy as the story of Moses. But I also understand the need to appeal to a general public, and like I said, I think they work it in pretty well. So I stand by it, at least by the songs. I do feel bad this movie is not more appreciated, and maybe it is because Ten Commandments was just such a landmark, and even though this is a good film, yeah, it's probably not really a landmark in any way. At least, not in the way that most people view cinematic landmarks. But I still think it's a good, strong film. 
better than Ten Commandments, in fact. It has great characters, it has a timeless story, it has wonderful music, it has breathtaking animation with some breathtaking visuals. Even if you're one of those people that can't fully get into it, I still say check it out, because there is some really great stuff in it. And I think the story of Moses deserves to be told from a different point of view, and this is a very smart point of view. What else can I say? I love it. I've seen it a million times before, and I'll definitely see it a million times again. I didn't see the road to El Dorado when it first came out because it just sort of looked cheesy. And in some ways, yeah, that's kind of what it is. And in other ways, it's actually really smart. But in other ways, the animation is a little lacking. But in other ways, it's fantastic. In other ways, maybe it would have been better as a live action film. But in other ways, animation is the perfect way to get across some of this comedy. And, oh boy, let's just look at the story. Two con men, played by Kevin Klein and Kenneth Branagh, come across a map for the city to El Dorado. As luck would have it, they wash across the shore where apparently the city is located, follow the map, and wouldn't you know it, they discover the lost city. But it's also inhabited, and two of the high priests, of course, confuse the two for gods. Not wanting to overlook what could possibly be the greatest con of their time, they of course play the part of the gods and see if there's a way for them to make a boat and take as much of the gold as possible. A young thief named Chell discovers their secret, and she plays along in the facade trying to show them the ways of the culture while never revealing who they really are. The writing for this movie is very good. Actually, it reminded me a lot of The Princess Bride. In fact, it felt eerily similar. A lot of comedy, a lot of jokes, but also still trying to get across an action adventure. My problem with the film? I'm really gonna sound weird for this, but the animation is actually too good. What do I mean by that? Well, Princess Bride was funny because it's live-action people acting like cartoon characters. And my theory is that if The Road to El Dorado was actually live-action, it would have been funnier. Now what sense does that make? You have an animated movie where characters are acting like animated characters. Shouldn't that be ideal? Well, the animation looks very similar to Prince of Egypt in that it's very pretty and it's very nice looking, but that doesn't always translate into comedy. The weakest part of The Prince of Egypt was the comedy. But that's okay, it wasn't essentially meant to be a comedy first. This is. And if you're going to do comedy and animation, you better have some damn funny comedic animation. This is where you need Warner Brothers to come in. You need the fast pace. You need the over-the-top reactions. They never allow them to get really big, goofy, over-the-top reactions. I think they were more concerned about making them look handsome. For the most part, it's pretty restrained. I don't know if that totally comes down to them being good-looking, though, because Shell's pretty good-looking, and she gets some really funny reactions. But I think in order to make something like this work, you need the team from, say, the Iron Giant or Hotel Transylvania. The people don't move realistically enough for us to mistake them for human, but they don't move cartoony enough in order for us to laugh at them. But with that said, I don't think it's a total abject failure either. Like I said, it is written very well, and some of the lines do get a good laugh. And you are not gods! You're not a god? How dare you! Particularly any point where they have to talk really deadpan. That seems to work. Oh, we expected you to be staying with us for the next thousand years. Well, as we say in the spirit world, there's your plan and then there's the god's plan. Mm -hmm. The action adventure stuff seems to work pretty well and it's good to look at, but again, it's not quite as big or grand as, say, something like Prince of Egypt. It's impressive, don't get me wrong, but when you really want big, grand moments, you need some big, grand animation and some big, grand angles, and yeah, it's okay, but could be stronger. The songs are by Elton John and Tim Rice, the same team that brought us The Lion King. And I think I feel the same way about this as I do about The Lion King. And if you know what I thought about The Lion King, that's not that great. But where I liked at least two songs from Lion King, I can't think of any songs I like from this one. Hell, I barely even remember them. And even that's sort of strange, because the heroes sing one song, it's obviously a musical number, but then they never sing any of the others. It's just Elton John singing it. So it's really out of place and odd. Though I will admit, It's Tough to Be a God will be in my head for weeks. But in the same way Hakuna Matata will be, and yeah, you know what I think of that. It's tough to be a god, but if you get the people's god, count your blessings yeah. keep them sweet, that's our advice. 
suppose in many respects I probably am being too harsh to this film because it's innocent enough. It's got some likable characters. It's bright. It's colorful. Some of the jokes work. You can just tell, though, this film is trying hard to make you laugh often, and if they really wanted that to work, they really needed some different animation. But it's upbeat, it's well written, it's got some good stuff. I think you could even argue there's some good commentary with the gods trying to play the priests against each other and how religions work, and I don't know, I think there's something there. And maybe in the end that's the best way to describe it. There's something there, it's just not fully realized. But for what it is, yeah, I'm glad I saw it. I don't think a ton of my time has been wasted or anything. I was kind of amused by kind of a good movie, and that's kind of all I gotta say about it. I'd say if you're looking around the video store and there's no other movies you can find, this one might be good to look at. But only a Princess Bride is. The team that brought you Wallace and Gromit now bring their first full-length animated feature, Chicken Run. This is a movie all the critics went nuts for. It was well written, it was well animated, it was different, it had a unique story. And it's another one, honestly, I think just sort of falls into the okay pile. But that's not bad, it's just okay. Why? Well, let's take a look. On a chicken farm in England, one little hen tries as hard as she can to escape every day, but is constantly caught and thrown back in. Things get more dangerous though when the owner of the chicken farm decides that she wants to start making pies out of the chickens. So the hens have to make it out before the machine that makes the pies is fully put together. Their answer comes in the form of a rooster played by Mel Gibson. He claims that he flew into the pen and that he can teach the chickens how to fly as well. The only downside is his wing is broken so he can't teach them right away. But he spends their time trying to verbally show them how to do it. But the clock is ticking away as they get closer and closer to pie day. It's a race to see if they can get out a la Great Escape style before the owner can turn them into mince meat. It was really great seeing this animation team finally do a full length motion picture and showing that they can pull it off and still have it be very entertaining. Its comedy is a little different from say something like Wallace and Gromit which was a little bit more quiet at times. This one is constant dialogue and constant visual jokes. But in a sense, it has sort of the same feel as Walden and Grummet as it's not always trying to make you laugh every second. It'll take time just to have a character breathe and talk about however they're feeling. A lot of people say there was a ton of grown-up jokes, but really, I didn't see them until maybe near the end. Great Scott, what was that? A Klingon cup! The entrance can't take it! I guess the only main problem I have with it is that the story is a touch too predictable. I mean, once again, we're gonna have the liar revealed backstory and it's not gonna be just brushed over either. It's gonna take up a good chunk of the third act with the characters moping and doping and oh Jesus, I've gone on and on about this. I'm not gonna prattle anymore. Let's just say it's boring. And I don't think the jokes are quite strong enough to make up for such a lackluster part of the movie. But like I said before, I still think it holds up as being okay. It is still very creative, it's got some memorable characters, it does have some good lines. The stop motion animation is always great to see, I mean this team always does a wonderful job. It's bright, it's colorful, it's mostly upbeat, it's very imaginative at times, and it has one or two bits for adults too. Had it not gone for the liar revealed story arc and maybe thought a little bit more out of the box, I would have liked it a lot more but I still think it's a decent flick. It's got just enough for kids and just enough for adults. I think it's worth at least a viewing. Alright guys, get the hate mail ready. I mean, really, get them ready. Get your fingers on the keyboards, here we go. I don't like Shrek. No! You heard right, I don't like Shrek. Do I hate it? No. Do I think there's some funny moments? Absolutely. But I thought the movie I was gonna get was gonna be a lot funnier, a lot darker, and a lot more creative. Which is not to say this film doesn't have any of those elements. It does. It has bits of those elements. But for what I thought I could get, and for what I did get, I just think it's really lacking. So, how can I be such an uneducated, cold-hearted bastard? I'll tell you after the story. Shrek, voiced by Mike Myers, is an ogre who lives in the swamp. 
He enjoys scaring the villagers and being just an all-around disgusting creature. That is, until one day a bunch of fairy tale characters are suddenly thrown into his swamp. The reason is the ruler of the land, played by John Lithgow, doesn't enjoy them anymore and wants them out of his sight. When Shrek goes to complain, the ruler sees an opportunity. You see, he's looking for a bride, and the prettiest one he can find is Fiona, voiced by Cameron Diaz, who's a princess locked in a tower. He convinces Shrek that if he goes and saves her, he'll get rid of all the enchanted elements in his swamp. Shrek agrees and is accompanied by a donkey, voiced by Eddie Murphy. So the journey is on to fight off dragons, Robin Hood, and rescue the fair maiden who turns out may have a few secrets of her own. Okay, so what don't I like about this film that has since nowadays become like the ultimate staple in movies to show your kids? Yeah, like I guess people really show this to their kids. I'm a little disturbed by that, but eh, that could be worse. So what's my main problem with Shrek? I can tell you in one word, boring. Most of it is just listening to Mike Myers and Eddie Murphy talk and I just don't think it's funny. Everyone was going on and on about Eddie Murphy in this movie. I was getting really excited to see him and just... Oh, no! this is gonna be fun. We can stay up late, swapping manly stories, and in the morning, I'm making waffles. Waffles? Really? That That's your big clincher? I'm not even sure I get it. Is it because he's a donkey and has hooves and can't make waffles? What's the joke? There's a scene where Shrek's trying to talk about how complex he is by comparing him to an onion and... You know what else everybody like? Parfait. Have you ever met a person you say, hey, let's get some parfait. They say, hell no, I don't like no parfait. Parfaits are delicious. No! You dense, irritating, miniature beast of burden. Ogres are like onions. End of story. Bye-bye. See you later. Ugh, I'm so, I, just, I don't find it funny. This is scene where they're crossing the bridge and... Don't do that! Oh, I'm sorry. Do what? Oh, this? Yes, that! Yes? Yes, do it. Okay. Ah! I'm sorry, I'm trying. I mean, I really want to like this movie, but every time I see it, I just fall asleep. Now, don't get me wrong. The scenes that are funny are really, really funny. Like, for example, I like the scene where the mirror is talking like a dating show host. The gingerbread man in general is pretty funny. That sort of weird theme park that's sort of a slam at Disney World, I got some laughs out of that. I just wish it was doing more humor like this, the satire humor. It was anything that had to focus on the characters that I wasn't really getting into. I just didn't find the characters that interesting or that funny or even designed that uniquely. I surprisingly don't have a problem with the dark stuff either, and maybe that's because I never really saw these as kids' films. I sort of saw them as older children and adults, and yeah, like I said, I think it's a little weird that people show their little kids this. But I'm fine with the darker humor, where she sings and blows up the bird that had me laughing on the floor. And then what are they gonna do with the eggs? Is she gonna raise them so that- No, she cooks them! That's fucking great! More of that, please! More of that! But no, what do we get? We get the princess and Shrek misunderstanding and they go and mope and dope and oh, this is just as bad as the liar revealed bit. Why are you supposed to feel bad here? You know exactly what's gonna happen. They're gonna realize they were idiots and get back together. Oh God, oh, and the stupid dumbass pop song. Just, ah! I know, I know, I'm probably being too harsh on it, but it just feels like there's a really smart, inventive crew behind this. And I want to see more of those jokes instead of these really not that imaginative characters. But now, I will say this about the character's story. The moral at the end, while well done to death, is executed great. I thought this was the fairy tale ending that a lot of other Disney fairy tales should have had. It adds a unique twist, but still makes them really happy, and it really serves the moral of what they're talking about. In that sense, I actually think the movie is great to show to kids. I think it gets across the message much stronger. But I still gotta sit through onion talk and bridge talk and fighting the dragon. Oh yeah, there's a female dragon, like that, that apparently got a big laugh, I guess. Female dragon, huh? Okay, her game together with the donkey is pretty funny, but the, yeah, that's a lot of buildup for just that one joke. I guess in the end, I don't really hate the film because there is some genuinely funny stuff, and I think there is some very unique ways of delivering its story and its message. I guess I was more just shocked at how much people were taking to it, like this was a brand new way of looking at film, and I don't know, I've seen this stuff in Simpsons, I've seen Disney sort of do it, and it, it just didn't seem that new or avant-garde to me. And on top of that, I guess I didn't see it as funny as everyone else did either. 
But clearly I'm missing something because people fell in love with this film. People still love it. They still watch it a million times and it's like this big, wonderful classic. But I guess it's just not my flick. Now Shrek 2, on the other hand, we'll get to that awesomeness later. Stallion of the Cimarron... Cimarron... Key. Yeah. Spirit! In some ways, this is one of DreamWorks' most adult films in that it doesn't really have talking animals, it doesn't have a ton of singing animals either, but it also has a narration by Matt Damon, odd choice, and... Probably the low point of any Sinbad movie is Sinbad himself. He's not an especially interesting hero, it's more the creepy creatures that he comes across and the fantastical elements. So when I saw Sinbad Legend of the Seven Seas, I was definitely keeping that in mind. And in many respects, this Sinbad is pretty much the same. He's good looking, a swashbuckler, has sort of a Brad Pitt personality, which figures because he's played by Brad Pitt. And they sadly really cop out with some lines like, Pretty cool, huh? That's exactly why women shouldn't drive. Uh, yeah. But as the film continued, I found that the less it's sort of tailored to, uh, yeah, that, the more fun and creative it got. 
When it wanted to treat itself like a real action adventure, it felt like a real action adventure. Maybe even up there with some of the original film series. The story? Sinbad is a thief who comes across an old friend who's a prince. He has this magic book that, I'll be very honest, I have no idea what it does, it's just sort of an important book, that must be kept safe in order for all the kingdoms to survive. But Ares, the goddess of fucking things up, decides she wants to do exactly that, and steals the book for herself. Everyone thinks Sinbad did it, but his best friend the prince thinks he didn't. So he offers up his life in exchange for Sinbad to go and get the book back. If he doesn't, then the prince is dead. Along the way, he's joined by a stowaway, played by Catherine Zeta-Jones, who's going to marry the prince, which of course makes her the stereotypical prince ambassador, Oh, So she actually has a title of responsibility and does shit. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm cool with that. She of course has to prove to Sinbad that she can handle herself and maybe even Sinbad. The film definitely sort of moves like a Sinbad adventure in that it's just sort of an action-packed road trip. They sail the seven seas, come across a bunch of weird creatures, and fight them off in order to get to their goal. And as far as those action scenes go, they're not bad. They're actually a lot of fun to watch and very creative. The characters at times succumb to sort of the typical cliches like the couple yelling at each other when of course you know they're gonna get together. Those horrible modern day catchphrases which, like I said, aren't often but when they do they stick out like a sore thumb. And once in a while a CG monster that looks just a little too fake. But let's get down to what the best element of the movie is, the villain. Oh, not that Eris is a particularly complex character or really even that interesting. But by god, look at the animation on her! The way she moves, the way she teleports, the way she shifts shapes! I don't know who the animation team was that worked on her, but give them all friggin' Oscars! This stuff looks wonderful! She moves as if she can be anything or anywhere. Her pets are literally the constellations that come to life. The world she lives in is a mystical marvel. It's just dull! Oh, every single time she's on screen, I just loved it! Every single second! Like, look at this here. She's supposed to turn into Sinbad and steal the book. Now, obviously, you could have her just shapeshift or walk behind a wall and she comes out as Sinbad or something, but look at this. She makes a puppet version of Sinbad and then slips into his skin. Who would even think of that? It's just that kind of creativity is spectacular. And actress Michelle Pfeiffer, who does the voice, obviously loves eating up the role. But like I said, the animation on her alone is worth it. So, on the whole, Sinbad is fun. It does leave room for some character development. It goes at a pretty enjoyable pace and knows when to show monsters and when to let people just be people. I'd say there isn't really that epic quality that a lot of the other Sinbad movies have, but there's definitely more personality to it, and I think that makes up for it. It's a swashbuckling tale with a lot of creativity and some great animation, and no black comedians looking for Turbo Man dolls. That's enough for me to say, take a look. While I said I never really got into Shrek and I always sort of thought it was an overrated comedy, Shrek 2 I think is one of the greatest comedies ever made. Its attention to detail, its speed, its jokes, its puns, its visuals, its characters, its pacing, its timing, this is a comedic marvel. I could watch this movie a million times and never get tired of it. When I saw the first Shrek film, this is the movie I thought I was gonna get. It turns out I just had to wait a flick later. But you know what? It's still worth it. The story? Shrek and Fiona are now both ogres, yeah, kind of spoiler from the last film, who are now off to visit her parents in order to get their blessing. The parents are of course shocked that Fiona is now and permanently an ogre, and that, on top of that, she married an ogre. The king especially is not pleased with this, so he hires a hitman to go after him. Or a hit cat by the name of Puss in Boots, voiced by Antonio Banderas. This character is so popular and so funny he would eventually get his own movie spin-off. We also find out there's a subplot going on with an evil fairy godmother, and a prince named Prince Charming, who wants to seize control by having Fiona marry him instead of Shrek. But Shrek just wants to make his bride happy and decides to take a potion to turn him human, thinking it will not only get the blessing of her parents, but also her love in return. Okay, here's a perfect example of why I love this movie. When at their house, Shrek looks outside and sees a bunch of guards waiting. All they have to do is play these royal horns and the guy has to read his message. But instead, they do this. Yeah. 
enough, Reggie. Just that one little tidbit. This movie is full of great moments like that. Tons of little touches here and there. Every second is trying to throw a joke at you, and the majority of them hit bullseyes. These are well thought out and well put together. But to make it even better, the characters are really likable. I actually think the romance between Shrek and Fiona is very legitimate. I like the resolution they have at the end. I like how far he's willing to go. I like the fact that through half of the movie, he doesn't look like his normal self. That's kind of a risky move. Donkey is funny. Yeah, I actually found Eddie Murphy hilarious in this, because, oh, I don't know, they gave him funny things to say. They also continue those great ideas with the fairy tale world, like they go to Far, Far Away, which looks like Beverly Hills. There's a low down bar where all the fairy tale villains hang out, called the Poisoned Apple. Isn't that a great name? The villain is a great villain, and her plan is really pretty diabolical. The climax is one of my favorites. With a little bit of a wink to Ghostbusters and one hell of a great song number, this is one of those scenes where I was invested, excited, and laughing the whole time. I've talked about it before in the past, I don't even know what else to say about it. It's just so good. And if you really get angry at me for not thinking Shrek is one of the best comedies of all time, take some comfort in that I think the sequel is. It had great heart, it had great comedy, it had a great story, it had great characters, it had great animation. It's just great. Fresh from the fight. Will Smith fish is scary, okay? I'm just putting out there right now. Will Smith as a fish is fucking disgusting. It's gross. I don't like looking at it. The idea that it's the main character is just fucking idiotic. Oh, and the movie Shark Tale, it really blows. Yeah, a good chunk of that comes from the fact that, oh, just look at the design of this thing. It's, ah! What kind of movie would allow a design like this to exist? Well, that's one of the main problems with the movie. It just sort of seems like a dumb idea from the start. Like, maybe it could be a little imaginative, but it seems more like an excuse to make a popular soundtrack with a lot of artists on it. And to shout a lot of catchphrases, and promote a lot of in-jokes, and ugh, some really horrible puns. I'm Katie Current. Muscle Crow! Get out those shell phones and call into the boss! Uh. I'm not gonna lie, out of all the DreamWorks anime movies, this one feels like the worst. It just feels like something that was created from marketing surveys. Like, what are the kids liking nowadays? Well, they like fish, and they like Will Smith. Throw that shit together. Throw on some pop culture phrases, and you have shit. Uh, all right, all right, let's look at the story. Will Smith Fish, yeah, that's what I'm calling him. I know the character has a name, but fuck it. You're never gonna call him that. You're just gonna call him Will Smith Fish. He's a fun, happening kind of guy who's being admired by Rene Zellweger Fish. Again, I'm sure it has a name, but it's just Rene Zellweger as a fish. He works at a whale wash instead of a car wash. Now, to be fair, that's actually kind of a clever idea. But things get out of hand when his boss, played by Martin Scorsese Fish, orders him to be axed because he couldn't pay the amount of money that he owed. Through a misunderstanding, Will Smith Fish seems to have killed a shark, which suddenly turns him into a hero, making everybody think that he's now the Shark Slayer. And as long as he doesn't let anyone know that it was all just a mistake, he remains the town hero. But somewhere across the sea, Robert De Niro Shark is having troubles with Jack Black Shark. They belong to some sort of shark mafia that Robert De Niro Shark is the head of. But Jack Black Shark is a vegetarian and doesn't like eating fish, which is a big letdown to Father Robert De Niro Shark. So to escape the family life, he makes a deal with Will Smith Fish. They'll make it look like Will Smith Fish kills Jack Black Shark, and thus he can disguise himself as a dolphin and start a new life over, blending in with the rest of his fishy buddies. The problems in this movie seem pretty obvious, and yeah, they are. A lot of the dialogue is just catchphrases, in-jokes, and puns. And on top of that, you almost never see these characters as actual characters, you just see the celebrities representing them. Also, you know my hatred for the whole Liar Revealed story, and while this one doesn't follow it quite exactly, it has a lot of the same elements and still doesn't throw in that many surprises. Let me put it this way, there's still a lot of moping and doping, it just doesn't happen after he reveals the lie. So we still get those really boring scenes that you don't give a shit about. 
I'll give it credit that some of the actors they choose were unique choices, and yeah, sometimes their deliveries can get a laugh, particularly out of Martin Scorsese and Robert De Niro, but Will Smith doesn't bring anything that he couldn't bring to any other role. Renee Zellweger is a pretty pointless choice. Jack Black has an incredibly annoying voice in this. Ugh, even Angelina Jolie Fish! Oh, I forgot to mention her! Ugh. You know they just picked him because of the names and no other reason. And on top of that, here's another big problem with the movie. I think the Will Smith fish is too stupid and too selfish. I mean, we know he's gonna do the right thing in the end, but Renee Zellweger fish gives him a pearl that I guess her mother or her grandmother gave her that's supposed to be worth a lot and that's gonna get him out of debt. What does he do? He doesn't pay off the debt, he goes to the races and bets it. Okay, that's not a charming little mistake, that is a dick move. And there's a couple times he does stuff like that. Something where he's supposed to be dependable, but it's not like a funny little mistake or something clumsy gets in the way. He makes a choice, and they're usually very dickish choices. So yeah, for me, I couldn't find much to like in this film. I thought the underwater world wasn't that creative, the celebrities were mostly pointless, the pun's insufferable. Sometimes I get a laugh, but god, the longer I had to look at Will Smith fish, the quicker I want to turn it off. And I suggest you get the jump on turning it off before you even start watching it. I'll be very honest, one of the reasons I didn't see Madagascar in the theaters is because I thought the characters were lamely designed. Maybe I was just too used to the Disney stuff, but I just thought they looked kind of cheap. So I didn't see it or any of the sequels, and I avoided it for a while. But when DreamWorks, you wary, yeah, I'm still calling it that, came around, naturally, I had to watch it. And you know what? It wasn't that bad. I think the real strength of it comes from the animation, the humor, and the fact that I legitimately didn't know where it was going. And I love movies that can do that especially considering where it started out. In a zoo, we see a lion, a zebra, a giraffe, and a hippo. The zebra, played by Chris Rock, is anxious to get out of his environment and into the wild. And a group of penguins are planning to escape the zoo and head for the Antarctic, and advise him to follow his dream and break out as well. But his friend the lion, played by Ben Stiller, a giraffe, played by David Schwimmer, and a hippo, played by Jada Pickett-Smith, don't keep a close enough eye on him and allow him to escape. This forces them to try and hunt him down, which results in them getting captured, thrown in boxes, and accidentally ending up on a deserted island. Well, mostly deserted. There's a tribe of rodents, led by Sasha Baron Cohen, who see their new friends as an opportunity to keep them safe away from other predators. But that might be a little complicated when the lion, it turns out, may actually slowly be turning into a predator himself. So I'm not gonna lie, when I saw the first few minutes of this, I said to myself, okay, I got this figure. This is just gonna be the fish out of water story. The friends are gonna be angry at each other. The tribe's gonna think they're one thing. Then we're gonna do that stupid liar revealed story and it's gonna suck, blah, blah, blah. I hope there's some good jokes. But actually, no, there's no liar revealed story at all. The focus actually comes down to whether or not the lion will give in to his temptation and actually start eating his friends. You know what? I haven't seen that. I think that's much more interesting, much more fun, and much more creative. And I think it's made even stronger by the fact that the four of them actually do seem to have a legitimate camaraderie. To a point where it actually sort of started to remind me of the wild. Yeah, which one of these came out first? Is this another Bugs Life and Ants thing all over again? Well, anyway, the one thing this has over the wild is the speed of the animation. I mean, there is just a lot of energy to it, and they're trying hard to make the comedy come from just the mere movement of them. And a good chunk of the time, it really works. The Penguins are also a lot of fun, and as expected, they pretty much steal the show. Everything they do is sort of like ninjas or secret agents. I've seen both spin-off shorts and a spin-off series based on these characters, and you can definitely see why. They're very enjoyable. While I don't think Madagascar is anything fantastic, I will admit it did have me laughing a lot of the time. The story did sort of have me guessing, and it's definitely bright and colorful and has a lot of great stuff for kids. I think it's a pretty decent family flick. It's smart, it's funny, it's entertaining. I don't think it's a classic by any means, but I think it's a lot of fun. I'd say go see it, but judging by the number of sequels they've already made out of it, you've probably already had to, so you've already drawn your own conclusions. Me personally, I'm glad I saw it, and I'm surprisingly even looking forward to seeing the sequels, but only if there's more penguins. They like to move it, move it. You like to move it, move it. Three, two, one.
So many of us are familiar with Wallace and Gromit, those wonderful stop-motion shorts that just had us, well, not always laughing, but intrigued. They were more likable than they were funny, though granted there were definitely some very good jokes in them. And we always enjoyed the creativity and imagination that went into making them. Well, now they have their first feature-length film, Wallace and Gromit, The Curse of the Were-Rabbit. In some respects, it's the most imaginative and tries the most jokes out. In other respects, you kind of get the feeling maybe it was trying a little too hard to please audiences. Which is not to say it's bad, it's just part of the charm of Wallace and Gromit was that it was just sort of doing its own thing. It could be quiet, it could be awkward, it could be weird. And this one, probably because it had more of a budget, definitely seemed more like a crowd pleaser. But, in some respects, it sort of succeeded. For those who don't know, Wallace and Grumma is a story about an inventor and his dog. The inventor, Wallace, constantly has harebrained schemes that his dog, Grummet, always has to rescue him from. And in this film, they're rabbit exterminators. Well, sort of. They don't really exterminate the rabbits, they just sort of take them off the property and, well, usually give them a home at their place. But one of Wallace's inventions goes awry, what a shock, when it accidentally creates a were-rabbit a giant creature that goes through all the people's farms and destroys their crops. Wallace and Grummet are on the case, but Grummet finds out there might be a more interesting twist to this than they think. And no, I won't give away any more than that. The movie is sort of a strange mix because I can say I probably laughed more at this Wallace and Grummet than I did the other ones. It just seemed like they were putting in more jokes and more fourth wall humor. But the one question you did constantly have to ask yourself is, did this work better as a half hour short? And personally, yeah, I think it sort of did. Something about squeezing it into that short amount of time, strangely enough, made it seem more large and epic. The villains I remember being especially threatening from those shorts. And this one is just sort of a pompous Ray Fiennes who's just sort of like the typical show-off jerk who doesn't get the joke. Yeah, there's not much to him. Maybe because the shorts were kind of on a smaller scale, you were more impressed when they did something legitimately large with them. In a movie, you're already sort of expecting something large. So it doesn't really surprise you, it just sort of gives you what you're expecting. But if what you're expecting isn't bad, like me, then this movie isn't really bad either. It's still Wallace and Gromit. It's still the same characters. It's still the same circumstances they usually get in. I just think it might have worked better if it was in a half hour short. But for what it is, it's a fun little movie. I can't really say if the solution is make it smaller or make it bigger, but I still like it. It's kind of hard to dislike something as innocent as Wallace and Gromit. The stop motion animation is always as spectacular. The sets are probably among the biggest that the studio has ever done. And it still has two characters we really like being the two characters we really like. I can't say it's the strongest out of what Wallace and Gromit have done, but I still think it's pretty likable. If you're a Wallace and Gromit fan, check it out. If you've never seen them before, I definitely say start with the shorts. I could not believe the cast they got for this movie when I saw the trailer. Bruce Willis, William Shatner, Steve Carell, Gary Shandling, Wanda Sykes, Catherine O'Hara, Thomas Hayden Church. These people are all comedy gold. So naturally, I got really, really excited to see the film, and yeah, it kind of sucked. It had a few jokes that worked and a couple likable characters, but yeah, this was really kind of bad. What's the story? A raccoon, played by Bruce Willis, accidentally destroys all the food that was belonging to a bear, played by Nick Nolte. The raccoon swears he can get all the food back for his hibernation in exchange for his life. The bear agrees, and the raccoon comes across a group of wild animals who have just discovered a hedge. And over the hedge, suburbia. The raccoon informs them that suburbia is full of food. All sorts of food practically gift-wrapped for them. So the animals agree to go and collect as much food as possible, unaware that the raccoon is actually saving him for himself. That is to say, the bear. Not only do we have to go through the liar revealed story again, which as you know, I really fucking despise, but I'll give you an example about why a lot of these jokes don't work. Take for example when the raccoon is first introducing them to opening up chips. Okay, here's why this joke doesn't work. First of all, they use it again. 
Now there, it works, because that's something negative happening to them, and it's so large that when you back off and show the planet and show the impact it's having, it's showing how much misery it's spreading. That's why that joke works. But if you're just opening a cheese snack, and if anything, it's just supposed to be something good, why would showing it from Earth matter? There's no misery involved, so there's not really any point in emphasizing it. At least not to that degree. And so much of the rest of the story is just building up character traits that are just gonna come into the story later and, well, not really make us laugh. They're just playing into the story. The story we already know because you set it up in the beginning and we know exactly what's gonna happen! None of the celebrities really lend much to the characters. I don't know if they weren't allowed to, or maybe it wasn't a good script, or I don't know, but their talents surprisingly don't bring anything. William Shatner is a possum who has to pretend to die all the time. I guess when you think about it, that could be pretty funny because we know what a hammy actor he is, but if it's animated and we're not really seeing Shatner, yeah, you kind of realize why this joke wouldn't work. Wanda Sykes is a skunk who has to be made to look pretty later on. Again, if you're not seeing Wanda Sykes, that doesn't really work either. I think the only one that really comes through is Steve Carell as the squirrel. This really super crazy hyper squirrel. But even he doesn't get as many laughs as the script should allow. It's aggravating because this is so much funny people and yet so few funny moments. Apart from the occasional joke that gets a giggle, the only time where it actually really starts to pay off is the ending. And it's a good setup. Once the liar's revealed, he tries to redeem himself by saving the day. The animals don't know this, and so they're constantly trying to throw him outside of the car where the bad guy is. Thank you, yes, yes. Let me in, let me in. No, ring-tailed charlatan. And this leads to some pretty funny physical humor. But aside from that, it's a snore fest and a real disappointment. This is good animation too, it's bright, it's colorful, you'd think it might be able to get a little commentary in there, I mean it was starting to with the food stuff. Or even lines like this. No, I can talk, I'm just driving. This could have been like a great satire of suburbia or a great animal point of view sort of film, but it's just dull, predictable, and like I said before, not that funny. All of these celebrities will go on to even bigger and funnier stuff, but I can tell you right now, this would definitely not be in that lineup. It's a little weird to see Nick Park's Wallace and Gromit design in the CG world. Maybe it had to do with the fact that their studio burned down around that time. Maybe this was meant to be stop motion, but because of that they had to make it CG. Well, whatever the reason, Flushed Away is a pretty enjoyable flick. It stars a mouse played by Hugh Jackman, who is owned by an incredibly wealthy family. But things get complicated when an old dirty mate of his drops by, and claims he wants to turn the place into a party hub. Jackman disagrees, but that doesn't really face his pal as he just flushes him down the toilet. What we discover is an underwater, er, under pipe, world, filled with ooey creatures, lots of villains, and a whole civilization. He comes across another mouse, played by Kate Winslet, pulling off sort of a gender reversal of the African Queen, riding her boat through the sewers trying to collect treasures for herself while also trying to save her fish out of water. There's an evil toad boss, played by Ian McKellen, who is destined to get more riches and power and vows to destroy anyone who stands in his way, which of course happens to be our two heroes. The under sewer world they create is incredibly fun and inventive which also gives way to a lot of jokes involving them using everyday props as, well, this. Uh, this dance of deception must end. Return what you have stolen from me. Enough dancing! That's wildly creative. The film also sort of has that British mentality and that very laid-back sort of humor, mixed in with a lot of goofy action scenes here and there. It creates for a lot of good chases, a lot of good jokes, and a lot of good character moments. It's a fun adventure that knows just when to throw in the right amount of jokes and just when to throw in the right amount of character. Hugh Jackman, of course, is the Pris who must learn to be tough, and Kate Winslet is the fun-loving action hero who must show him the way. They get along well, they share pretty good chemistry, and they have several moments of trying to rescue the other. I think this was the film I started to realize that DreamWorks was sort of the out-of-the-box animation company. In that, yeah, they're making sort of these general films for the general public, but they're really thinking of these odd, abstract ideas to put in these general audience-pleasing films. And I think it's a good mix. The general movie public can get sucked into the characters and sort of the everyday emotions, 
but then they can laugh when something just so bizarre and so strange pops up, like this. And Flushed Away is definitely one of those movies that employs a lot of those tricks. It's a lot of fun to watch. It's got some great voice acting, it's got some good animation, it's got that wonderfully strange British humor. It's one of the only films that goes down the toilet, but in a good way. I know I wasn't a big fan of the first Shrek film, but I absolutely adored the second one, so I didn't really know what to expect with the third one. Would they up the ante or take a giant step backwards? A giant step backwards. Right down to the villain being one that we already had, Prince Charming. Yeah, that's right, half of the evil duo from the last movie. It's kind of like the Riddler and Two-Face being the criminals in one movie, and the next one it's just Two-Face. But that's not the only reason to not like the movie. The dialogue is clumsy, the characters awkward, the pacing pretty inconsistent, and the jokes not all that funny. Okay, so what's going on in this film? Actually, what isn't going on? Fiona's father dies in a surprisingly kind of distasteful death scene, which means now Shrek has to be king. But Shrek doesn't want to be king, so he sets off to find the real owner of the throne, Arthur, a whiny little awkward teen played by Justin Timberlake. Well, Amid does get a laugh here and there. They go to the help of Merlin, played by Eric Idle, who also gets a lot of really good laughs, actually. But while that's going on, they figure out that Prince Charming has taken over far, far away, and is holding the queen and the princesses hostage. So, Shrek has to make it back and save the day, while Fiona has to break out with her ladies to take back the kingdom. All while also tying in a story that Fiona is pregnant and Shrek is nervous about being a father. As you can tell from the plot, that's a lot going on but it could still potentially work as long as they keep the characters in focus and throw in a lot of good humor. Which, as I said before, they really don't. I remember when I saw this with an audience, most of the people were just sort of sitting there in silence. I mean, there was a laugh here or there and one or two good lines, but kind of like the first one, the plot just sort of moves and meanders without too many jokes even really being told. There's not even really that many new characters. I remember Arthur was kind of enjoyable, and Merlin was pretty funny. And the gimmick of the princesses going from damsels in distress to fighters is funny for a bit, but quickly wears that joke out. And yeah, that's about it. When I think of Shrek 2 and I think of all the great characters we got from that, Puss in Boots, the Fairy Godmother, Prince Charming, the King and Queen, the disgruntled elves that worked for the Godmother, I remember so much from that film and yet remember so little from this one. And I think what makes it even worse than something like the first Shrek film is that, while I'm not a fan of the first Shrek film, at least it had a good setup for a story. And it did have a decent heart to it, as well as a good moral. This one just seems much more choppy, with some jokes coming in at inappropriate moments and others where there should be funny jokes. The dramatic moments rarely pay off. I think for me, it's probably the least of the series. I don't know a ton of people that like it. I mean, I'm sure it has a few fans out there, but I've never met anyone that said, oh yeah, Shrek the Third, that's my favorite. It's a shame that after a sequel as good as Shrek 2, they couldn't have a follow-up that was just as good, especially with so much stuff going on. Would this be the end of anything good coming out of the Shrek franchise? Well, I'll fill you in when I get around to Shrek 4. But for this one, I say you can definitely skip. Ever since I was stung as a child, I had this enormous hatred for bees. If I ever saw one around, I'd either try to beat the crap out of it or run away like a pussy. But when I saw Jerry Seinfeld's bee movie, it suddenly made me realize, I used to really like bees. Yeah, as a kid, anytime there was bees on TV or in cartoons or something, I always thought they were cool. I used to love those old Down Duck cartoons or the Honey Nut Cheerios commercials. I actually really liked bees. And seeing this film reminded me why. There is sort of this creativity and ingenuity that can be brought out of from what they are. And this movie takes full advantage of that, using their jobs, their homes, their abilities, and even their coronation to make some really memorable, funny scenes. So what's the story? Jerry Seinfeld is a bee who's just graduating from... bee school. 
I guess. You'll never guess what he got in his report card. And a perfect report card. All bees. Yeah, there's a few other bad puns like that too. But he has a problem. He doesn't like the idea that he's going to be assigned to one job for the rest of his life. So he decides to go out and see the world before he does. Alright, so this is going to be like Ants, right? Where he's trying to fight for free will and the individual and such. Actually, no, he comes across a woman played by Renee Zellweger and decides to reveal that he can actually talk and they share a nice relationship together. Okay, so what? Everyone's going to say you can't date a human and it's going to be fighting against prejudices there? Actually, no! When he discovers that honey is being used by humans, he decides to sue the human race. And it turns into this gigantic trial, trying to show that bees are people too. Well, not literally, but you know what I mean. All right, so what, he's gonna win the court case and everyone's gonna be happy and actually no! The bees, it turns out, gets too much honey, which means they don't have to work anymore, which means they don't pollinate anymore, which means all the plants of the world start to die. And now it's up to Seinfeld and Zellweger to try and get the world back to order. You know what? Freaking kudos to this movie. I honestly had no idea where it was gonna go. And I love films like that. They're constantly making me guess. Though the one downside is everything I was talking about before, like Seinfeld being tied to his job, never addressed again. The prejudice of a bee dating a human, never addressed again. Hell, even the fact that she's married to Patrick Warburton and she's kind of having an affair with a bee, you guessed it, never addressed again. So I guess in that sense, it's somewhat lazy. In that it just sort of stops story arcs that were starting to get going and then just goes to something else. But what pulls it through is the fact that it has a very likable cast, very likable animation, very likable colors, very creative atmospheres and environments, and it's just straight up funny. I mean, like I said before, some of the puns really do die and they're pretty lame, but a lot of these jokes really hit bullseyes, even ones I think wouldn't hit bullseyes. Like I saw this B. Larry King and I remember thinking to myself, oh my god, really? Are they honestly doing this? But then they turned into something funny. You know, they have a Larry King in the human world, too. It's a common name. Next week on B. Larry King. No, no, I mean, he looks like you, and he has a show with suspenders and different colored dots behind him. Next week on B. Larry that King. old guy glasses, and there's quotes along the bottom from the guest you're watching, even though you just heard him. I'm usually not a fan of Seinfeld as an actor, per se, nor really Renee Zellweger, but... Both of them are incredibly likable in this. Seinfeld's a good-hearted wisecracker, and Zellweger's sort of a good-hearted eccentric. Even the side characters like Patrick Warburton, Chris Rock as this laid-back mosquito, or Matthew Broderick as the best friend. Yes, even Broderick's tolerable in this. But on top of that, the ideas for this world they create are just so likable and, I don't know, it just brought me back to being a kid again. I mean, listen to some of these ideas. Wow, what does that do? Catches that little strand of honey that hangs after you pour it. Saves us millions. And on top of that, I think there's something about DreamWorks animation that I don't know what they do, but they can really simulate motion well. Particularly flying. The flying scenes in this movie really work, and it really feels like you're off the ground and you're traveling with these creatures. Even getting stuck to a car, you feel like you're really on that car being pushed against the windshield. I really didn't expect to like B-Movie going into it, and yeah, some parts don't work. I mean, some of the animation is a little odd, particularly on the humans. Some of the puns can get old, and the story is sort of all over the place. But I still liked the characters, the ingenuity, the creativity, and the spontaneity of it. I was pleasantly shocked by it and was really happy to see it. It's one of the few movies I wish would be re-released on the big screen. Maybe even in 3D! I love to see these moments on the big screen. I think I sort of missed out. So I guess if you're looking for a movie that has a little bit more depth or story arc to it, you're probably not going to find it here. But if you're looking for something lighthearted with some good laughs, some good voice acting, and a lot of creative designs and animation, then I say B-Movie is definitely a flick to check out. <laughs> Talk about the ultimate never judge a book by its cover movie. Kung Fu Panda, I think, is the dumbest sounding title I've ever heard. And it looked like the film was gonna represent that stupid sounding title, too. Jack Black as a panda, get ready to ask for the refund. But watching this film, not only was I shocked at how funny and likable the characters are, but good god, it's beautiful! I couldn't believe how much atmosphere, movement, color, and even sort of classic philosophies that this movie adapted. I think it's actually sort of right up there with Shrek 2 as one of the great animated comedies. 
Okay, so Jack Black is a panda named Poe. He's a big fan of the Fearsome Five, a group of martial artists who are actually all named after martial arts moves. Like the snake, the crane, the monkey, and so forth. At one point, their great master is about to choose who's going to be the Dragon Warrior, the martial artist who's going to lead the way and save the day. Poe accidentally gets flung into the mix, and the master selects him. Everyone, including Poe himself, thinks that the master has made a mistake. But the master believes that the chips fall where they may and decides to go ahead with his decision. Poe's teacher, played by Dustin Hoffman, tries everything he can to train him so hard that he'd have no choice but to go away. But Poe is so excited and so full of determination that it never even comes into his mind. But when an ancient evil breaks out of prison and vows to destroy them all, the race is on to see if they can get Poe to be the real dragon warrior before the villain arrives. The world they create is a very unique and pretty world to look at. It lives sort of in that same timeline as Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, or other martial arts movies, but it has a modern day sense of humor. And it's a good modern day sense of humor. Poe is very likable in his innocence and his need not to give up. And the other characters are very relatable in how they think they've been gypped, but slowly start to open up to his charm. While it is essentially a comedy, it does surprisingly well mixing in drama, and the emotions that anyone would feel being put in these circumstances. The teachings and the philosophies actually do sort of stick to a martial arts set of ideals. I mean, okay, it's either a little played down or exaggerated, but they're still there. And on top of that, the martial arts in this movie is pretty good too. The film totally takes advantage of the fact that it's animated and it's a comedy, and it gives us some unbelievably fast, stylish, action-packed fight sequences. These are great fun to watch. If I did have one problem with the movie is that the villain does seem kind of weak. I mean, he's not terrible, the voice actor isn't terrible, even the design isn't that bad. They even gave him a decent backstory. But I think compared to everything else and just how much he's been built up, you could have had someone either more evil or more funny in this part. They tried to play it half and half, but eh, I think they should lean more towards one or the other. But honestly, that's a nitpick. He still serves as a threat, he's still really cool at what he does, and he even gets a funny line here and there. Overall, I think Kung Fu Panda is wonderful. And just saying that sentence sounds so strange to me. Kung Fu Panda is wonderful. But you know what? If there's anything the movie wants to teach, it's never judged solely by appearances. And maybe it teaches that lesson a little better than I thought. Even to a point where the film looks so ridiculous and over the top that it actually sort of works. Strike that, it doesn't sort of work, it really works. Kung Fu Panda is a great film for children and adults of any age. It's energized, it's fun, it's smart, it's humorous, it has great characters, it has a wonderful story. See it if you haven't already. Our animal friends return in Madagascar Escape to Africa. I really hate movie titles that have the number in the title. For example, Escape to Africa. Does it really make things any easier? Madagascar 2. There, that was a lot shorter and a lot simpler. But anyway, how's the movie fare out? Well, the first one I thought was funny, particularly in the animation department. And this one, well, seems to be a little funnier. It knows what to do with its characters and knows how to keep fresh jokes coming. And it knows how to keep a fast pace, but also keep a good heart. The film starts out exactly where it left off, with our heroes still stuck on the island. But they figure out an almost foolproof way to get themselves back by repairing the plane and putting it on a giant slingshot. This doesn't quite get them back to New York, but it does get them to Africa, where everyone seems to fit in really, really well. The lion is reunited with his mother and father, the hippo finds a new love, the giraffe's germophobia upgrades him to doctor, and the zebra manages to fit in too. Maybe even a little too well. Things start to come undone though when the lion, it turns out, has to pass some sort of test in order to stay in the herd. But seeing how he's a performer and not really a survivor, he finds that task is much harder than it seems. And the rest of our heroes also find that there's downsides to their paradise as well. Will they stay and work it out, or is it time to move on to movie number three? Well, seeing how movie number three has them in Europe, I think it's kind of a safe bet to assume what's gonna happen. But again, what makes it good is in what comedic ways it happens. And once again, the movie really shines in the comedy and the animation. It's got some low points, like I'm finding out more and more that Jada Pickett Smith and David Schwimmer characters are not especially interesting. At least, not in the joke department. I also think the villain is kind of weak. 
well, maybe not weak, just not funny. Alec Baldwin does a good job playing a slimy, unlikable, detestable creature. And he's also good in the movie too, <laughs> I digress. He actually does do a good job, it's just I would have liked a little bit more comedy to come out of him. That's Bernie Mac playing the lion's father, doing a surprisingly very heartfelt performance. Not too many funny lines come out of him, but it still feels very genuine. I'm finding more and more of my favorite character out of these movies is the zebra. Something about Chris Rock's lines and his delivery and his performance, I don't know, it just cracks me up. He's so likable and energetic. And in this one, just having a million Chris Rock's talk, I don't know, that just really cracks me up for some reason. The irony! Exactly the same! Oh, and guess who else is back? That crazy old lady that just had a quick cameo in the first one. But now, she's like one of the main characters. She leads an abandoned safari hunt group. A bunch of the tourists almost go Lord of the Flies, and by God, she is just determined to find this lion again. I don't know what her beef is, but she just kills me. And that's one of the movie's strong points. It knows when to keep continuing jokes, which characters to hold on to, but also knows when to add new material and up the ante. It isn't just a rehash. It gives us exactly what we want while also mixing it with new things. The result is an energy-filled, funny comedy. I find myself really enjoying these movies. They just don't seem like other animated flicks out there. They seem to really take advantage of the fact that it's animation, they can do slapstick, they can do verbal humor, they can do heart. They can just throw whatever they want without feeling they have to conform to say the Disney style or the Pixar style or heck, even sort of the DreamWorks style. And it seems to balance out really, really well. If you're not a fan of the first one, I don't think the second one will really sway you at all. But if you do like the first one, the second one is more of the same great comedy while also upping the new stuff. I say check it out and have some fun. Monsters vs. Aliens, how can you go wrong with a title like that? You don't. Well, for the most part. The film definitely gives what it promises, Monsters vs. Aliens, but sometimes it gives some really lame, really not well thought out jokes. But to make up for that, I think it gives us some very memorable characters, most of them anyway, and a very creative premise. The story starts off with a woman named Susan who's about to get married, but through, of course, a tragic accident, she transforms herself into a giant and is captured by the government to be used as, well, a weapon freak of nature. So they put her with the other weapon freaks of nature, including a big-eyed scientist, the missing link, and a one-eyed blob. For the most part, they just keep them there safe until some sort of threat ever comes by. And wouldn't you know it, a threat comes by. Aliens from another planet start to invade the Earth. The president, played by Stephen Colbert, tells them to send in their top men, or freaks. This is where our four heroes come in. Can they stop this invasion while also trying to find their place to fit in with humanity? The film suggests yes, but let's not jump to conclusions. The strength of the movie does come from our main character, Susan. She was planning just to be an everyday housewife with a nice normal life, when suddenly this freak accident occurred. And she plays it in a way where you really do feel legitimately sorry for her. Her fiancé turns out to be a jerk, everybody's horrified of her even though she would never harm a mouse, and now the army wants to use her as a weapon to destroy even though she has no training whatsoever. Her problems are definitely the heart of the movie. But that's not the only thing to like. Seth Rogen is the blob with the one eye and he gets a few good lines. Colbert as the president is pretty much as funny as it sounds. Eat lead, alien robot! Evidently they eat lead. Get him huh. on the chopper! Ha! I'm brave! I'm a brave president! And even the evil aliens get a good giggle here or there. I found out my parents were... No child should ever have to endure that. So I went on the road with a giant... Where the film falls flat is sort of the other characters. Like the missing link I don't really remember that much, and the scientist I don't really remember that much. Some of the jokes range from kind of a good idea to just kind of stupid. Yeah, remember that scene. And sometimes the animation can be a little odd. I don't know, sometimes the people look a little too weird to me. But again, they sort of level that out with some really creative action sequences, and do a great job in giving everybody their size and scope, especially considering the fact that they make Susan the main character, so you can get a lot of fun angles with height and size that way. So on the whole, Monsters vs. Aliens isn't a super strong film, but I think it's enjoyable to watch at least once, maybe even twice. 
Anytime a joke sort of keels over and dies, they always make up with it with either a lot of heart or a lot of action. It's a fun flick and definitely worth your time to check out. By all outward appearances, I should hate How to Train Your Dragon. This has so many things I can't stand in a movie. The geeky dweeb who becomes the hero. The prejudiced parent who will never listen. The misunderstanding that'll break them apart and just result in them moping and doping. The hiding the pet so that nobody sees him. A lean towards modern day talk in a fantasy world. This is stuff I usually can't stand. But for some reason, here, it really, really works. There's just something about the way this story is told and presented and paced that just really, really gets it. It's almost like I was hearing this story for the first time, even though I've heard it a million times before. Which is funny, because the people who did this also directed Lilo and Stitch, another movie that's been done a million times, but seemed very fresh and new when they put their spin on it. And this movie works very much the same. A young boy lives in a world of Vikings, who spend most of their time trying to fight off dragons. Why? Because they believe dragons are evil. And who can blame them? They constantly attack, breathe fire, and are just dangerous animals. But the boy starts to see things a little differently when he comes across a wounded dragon in the middle of a field. So the boy decides to study him. As he spends more and more time with him, he realizes that dragons are not inherently evil. They're like any other animal. As long as they can be understood, they can be trained to be peaceful. And he uses this advantage to fight off other dragons, in a sense. He doesn't really fight them, he actually finds non-violent ways to defend them off. Which gets the attention of the village, and more importantly, his father. Who always regard him as a bit of a disappointment, but now finally sees something they can connect with. But gee, will the truth be revealed, and will the father's prejudice get in the way to where he says he doesn't have a son and all that other stuff? Yes, but it's actually done pretty good here. The only thing I can think of as to why it works here and not in other stories is that the pacing is just so good. In that every single time something happens, you see how it affects the character. You see when the boy learns something that it'll sink in. You see him actually taking the time to figure stuff out with the dragon. Even his father, you can see sort of the turmoil he's going through with trying to love his son, live with his son, hate his son. He goes back and forth like a real human being would, and not just a one-dimensional character. He's not just a bad guy, he's a human being who happens to have a prejudice, but it's a prejudice you can well understand. That doesn't mean it doesn't break his heart when he has to disown his son. And maybe that's what makes it stand out. Every emotion feels genuine. When the characters are happy, they feel genuinely happy. When they're jealous, they feel genuinely jealous. And when they're heartbroken, you really feel how heartbroken they are. And I think so much of that just comes from the fact that they take the time to let us know these people. And it's not rushed. The flying scenes are unbelievable. I mean, they are just beautiful to look at. When this movie came out, it was in 3D, and I still stand by this is the greatest looking 3D movie I've ever seen, even better than Avatar. I saw it in IMAX, and it blew me away. Every time there's a flying scene, you felt like you were on this dragon and you were riding through the canyons. I don't know what they did, how they did it, but more movies need to do it. Or at the very least, re-release this movie so we can see it again in IMAX 3D. Because I know a lot of people who didn't see it that way, and they should see it that way. But the great thing about the film is, even if you take that aspect out of it, it's still a good story, and there's still good characters. It's one of the few movies that can have this combination of things I usually don't like, and can somehow really pull it off. It can be funny, it can be harsh, and it can be very, very genuine. The one problem I have with the film is when it's revealed exactly how the dragons work. Even to this day, I'm sort of confused how it all goes down. It's like there's a giant dragon, and all the little dragons have to feed that giant dragon, so they're kind of slaves, but they can just fly off if they wanted, couldn't they? Why did they have to return to this dragon? Why is that the reason they have to attack the people? It's pretty confusing. But once again, they make up for that with just how creative and cool the dragons are and how different each one is, and how they function. Each one has their weakness, each one has their strength, each one even sort of has its own personality. Like I said before, a lot of time went into the details of this film. I think it's just a straight up wonderful flick. If at any point you can see it in IMAX in 3D, definitely take advantage of it. But if not, it's still a great film regardless.
Shrek Forever After, the final film in the Shrek legacy, I guess? Is it as good as the second one? Is it as bad as the third one? I think it's kind of somewhere in the middle. Out of all the movies, I say this one is probably the second best, but then again, I don't really think much of the other movies apart from the second. It appears Shrek is now a family man. He's living back at the swamp with his wife and children, and at first it seems pretty nice. But then day after day after day of doing the exact same thing finally starts to wear on him. To a point where he says he just can't take it anymore. He has a blow up with his family and comes across a little man named Rumpelstiltskin. He makes a deal with Shrek that he can give him one day to do whatever he wants as long as he can just take one day away from his life. Shrek agrees, and wouldn't you know it, the one day taken from his life was the day he was born. So now Shrek lives in a reality where he doesn't exist, and Rumpelstiltskin rules the land. Nobody knows who he is, and he has to convince everybody that he's a good guy. Donkey's a slave, gingerbread man is a cracker. <laughs> That's the best lie in the movie. What are you talking about, cracker? And Fiona is now the leader of a resistance of ogres. The film in no way reaches the harder comedy that 2 had, but at the same time, I will admit, I did sort of want to know what was going on. I was more intrigued with how Shrek was going to get out of this and the alternate reality that was created from his decision. I like seeing the characters in different roles. I like seeing them do different things. The downside is that it doesn't really lead to a lot of funny moments. And I mean that sort of in the same way as the first film, like it's almost not trying to be that funny, it's more trying to just tell the story straight up. Which isn't necessarily bad. I'd much rather they try to tell a good story than just have them try to tell a bunch of jokes that really fail. And there are a few good laughs in this. So I guess my only two major problems with this movie is, one, the fact that it could use a lot more jokes, and yeah, it's a comedy, I do think that's a bit of a problem. And two, this scene. All I want is for things to go back to the way they used to be. You mean back before you rescued me from the Dragon's Keep? Exactly! I think the scene where Shrek blows up at Fiona is way too out of character and way too mean-spirited, even for Shrek. It just didn't feel right. I mean, I know he's at his boiling point, but no, this, this doesn't work. We're supposed to still like this guy and feel sorry that he said this stuff, but when you say things like that, that's pretty nasty. And I think that really does harm a lot of the film, even though it's just a small scene. But for everything else, I guess it's an okay film. I mean, for a movie that really didn't need to exist. I can't really say it's bad. I wanted to know what was going to happen. I like the villain of the movie. I like the alternate outcomes. But nothing really screams go see it to me either. So my thought is, if you just sort of want to see the Shrek movies just to finish up the Shrek movies, you won't be that disappointed. It's got a laugh here or two, and it will keep your attention. However, if you're looking for a really good strong comedy with really good strong characters, you might want to go back to the second one. Not the best, not the worst. Take it for what it is. As soon as The Tick came around, superhero parodies have become a dime a dozen. There's some real good ones, there's some real bad ones. But bottom line, the shtick has been done to death. So if you're gonna do it, you should have a really damn good angle. Megamind sort of does. It's nothing really that new, it's the superhero, supervillain, and damsel in distress sort of taking on roles they wouldn't usually take on. So from a comedic standpoint, it doesn't really work that great, but from a dramatic standpoint, it actually has a few good moments. We have Megamind, played by Will Ferrell. He's in the process of trying to destroy a superhero played by Brad Pitt by kidnapping his lady, played by Tina Fey. All three of them have gone through this shtick dozens of times. The hero always wins, the villain's thrown in jail, and the damsel is always rescued. That is except for one day, when it appears that Megamind actually wins. Yeah, he actually destroys the superhero and ends up taking over the world. But he quickly realizes taking over the world is kind of boring. Now that he has it, he doesn't know what to do with it. He has all the power in the world, but nobody to love him. He doesn't know how to feel or what to do about it, so he gets in contact with Tina Fey again. She, of course, tries to stay away from him, but over time, she starts to notice the true tragedy of the character. In fact, even a very bizarre sort of romance starts to form. That is, until Megamind thinks he figures out what he needs. He tries to find an everyday schmo and give him superpowers. So that way, he'll have an arch nemesis yet again to fight. But the downside is the arch nemesis actually doesn't want to do good, which forces Megamind to ironically be the hero. And once again, having to save the damsel in distress. 
So if you're familiar with superhero knockoffs and parodies, a lot of this is pretty familiar. And it's not unfunny, it's just maybe a little too familiar. We've seen it over and over again. But it is with still very likable characters. Brad Pitt even has a pretty funny story near the end about how he comes to a conclusion about himself, and how. But oddly enough, most of the movie is sort of spent in conversations, mostly between Megamind and the romantic lead. They're pretty good conversations. I'll admit, I probably would like a few more laughs out of this. I mean, I would like to see a comedy, but for these conversations they're having, it's not bad. I actually do end up caring for both of them and am sort of curious where the relationship between the two of them is going to go. The action in the movie is good, but not as good as some other DreamWorks animation. The side characters get a few laughs, but not enough to take away focus from the main characters. I guess I really only have two major problems with it. One is, yes, I could have used a lot more jokes. I mean, it's a parody of superheroes, there's so much you can do with that, and people have done with that, and I don't know, I just sort of feel like we got Incredibles again. Taking what should be a superhero comedy and making it actually pretty serious but to be fair from a different point of view. And the other thing is, I find it a little distracting that Megamind becomes the hero, the hero becomes, well, okay, I won't give it away, but it's kind of the opposite. And the damsel becomes still the damsel. Yeah, that kind of bothered me. I mean, yeah, she goes through a change and that she sort of becomes interested in Megamind, but come on, we're really gonna hang her off the tower again? We're really gonna do this whole shtick? You were doing so good in making her an interesting character, then you just go marry Jane on our asses. Why couldn't she be the hero, and maybe the superhero the villain, and maybe Megamind the person has to be saved? You know, some sort of switch up that made sense and equaled out. I don't know. To me, it just seemed like a big missed opportunity. But for what we did get, I think Megamind was a cute film. I'd say it certainly has more adult moments than other DreamWorks movies in that, well, there's a lot of sitting down and talking. But like I said, I think the characters are enjoyable enough to listen to. And you even get pretty wrapped up in their drama. I don't think it's a grand film in terms of superhero flicks or even emotional dramas, but it's not bad. I came out glad to know that the characters I wanted to be okay came out okay. Not a great film, but a good one. I'd say it's definitely worth checking out. villain. He has a fantastic backstory. He has a great design. He has a devious voice. But they still managed to get some good comedy out of him, too. I envisioned it a little to the left. Perfect. With the weapon by my... a little bit more.
perfect films. Everything has been stepped up to the next level. The action, the characters, the story, the visuals, and of course, a great villain. However, is there a downside? Yes, there is. It came out the same weekend as fucking Hangover 2. So, everyone went to see the same rehash bullshit that wasn't even really that funny in the first one. Instead Let's wrap up DreamWorks Uary with Madagascar 3, the third and presumably last in the Madagascar movies. And I have to say, this seems like a series of movies that just keeps getting better and better. The first one was funny, the second one was really funny, the third one is just constantly hilarious. Except when it needs to be heartfelt and sentimental, and it does that very, very well. It has the same great characters, the same great energy, the same great animation, and a whole bunch of visual wonder. The story starts off, much like the last one, exactly where it left off. Our crew is still stuck in Africa, but the penguins have apparently taken the plane and gone to Europe to try and find help. But it seems they've been taking too long, so the animals decide to take matters into their own hands and just go to Europe themselves. Which is strange, why didn't they go there before? Eh, cartoon logic, it runs on cartoon logic. They catch the penguins gambling and try to take their winnings to get a ride back home. But the police is called on them and a fearsome creature named Le Capitaine Dubois is on a quest to add the missing part of her collection, a lion. She obsesses over getting her prize and will stop at nothing until the lion's head is hers. Trying to find a way to escape, the animals find a circus train and sneak on board. But in order for them not to blow their cover, they say that they're circus animals, and thus the circus train welcomes them aboard. Thinking they can use this as a means to get back home, they buy the circus with the money they have, and see if they can use their talents to work their way back to the city. The only problem is, the circus stinks. They used to have a lot of great talents on board, but most of them have fallen flat in the past few years. So it's up to our main characters to try and get the circus back on track, while also avoiding the watchful eye of La Capitaine. Not only did this movie have the most laughs, but I think it also had the most funny characters. As Frances McDermott as La Capitaine, and honestly, you can never tell. She just gets lost in the role and you're too busy laughing at her in order to figure out that it's actually her playing it. That's also Martin Short as an Italian seal, and again, you would never know. He just does such a great job, you would never figure it out. Hey, I have a great idea! Maybe you come up with us to Rome! <laughs> Hey, Vitaly is just playing around. <laughs> the rest of the actors, once again, just do great in reprising these roles and being incredibly entertaining and giving great deliveries. And once again, they do great in balancing out the heartfelt moments as well. Including a circus performer that used to be the top of the world, but has since then become afraid, even terrified of letting people down with his stunts that he doesn't think can work anymore. Now, it's true the story does work its way, I guess, into the inevitable liar reveal plot, which a lot of you know I really despise. But A, they don't focus on it very long. And B, in this story, it sort of works. There's a very surprising yet genuine twist when they get back to their home. And taking into account everything they've gone through in the other movies, you'd almost swear this was planned. Like they knew they were gonna do this from the start. Now, the only other element that might be a little distracting is this movie was shot in 3D, and while it's not as bad as other 3D films that like to show off their technology, this one definitely does get some weird shots at times. Not quite to the point where it's distracting, but you can definitely kind of take notice. But in other scenes, it's so visually interesting and incredibly colorful, you don't mind. The actual performance of the circus when they get it perfected is just wonderful to look at. It's imaginative, it's musical, it's upbeat, it's energetic, 
I haven't quite seen anything like that in the other two Madagascar films, and that's one of the reasons I think this one's the best. But that's not the only reason. The characters still work great off each other, it has a great villain, it has great side characters, it has good drama, it has good comedy, it has good visuals, it has funny subplots. Everything about it just seems to work out perfectly. I really do hope they stop here because I don't think they could top it after this. It seemed like every film was getting closer and closer to that wild yet really imaginative comedy. And here, I think it's perfected, while also having some characters you really do care about and you want to see them get through their predicament. Films like these make me really happy that I did DreamWorks you wary, because honestly, I probably wouldn't have seen them. It shows you that a series of films you think is just getting worse and worse, sometimes it turns out it's just getting better and better. And speaking of better and better, I hope that DreamWorks does nothing but do that with its animated films. They've been creative, they've been inspiring, they've been dramatic, they've opened up the doors to all sorts of new realms of imagination. It's been great reviewing them, and all I can say is, I hope to see more great products in the future. Three, two, one.